Our first speaker this afternoon is Helen Hayes. She's the director of the Great Gold Island Project, and she is going to be talking about the Great Gold Island turns here and there. Helen? Whoops. I have to get up. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be invited to talk here. You have a wonderful facility, and the title of this talk, Great Gull Island Here and There, means that we're going to hear about Great Gull Island first, and then about the work that we've been doing in South America. <clears throat> the two species of terns, I'm sure you'll all recognize, the common on the left, the roseate on the right, <clears throat> they look a little different during the breeding season. The roseate is long tail. They sound different, but they don't look different in the winter. They, their bills fade, their legs fade, and they look very much alike. Great Gull Island was a fort, Fort Mikey. Um, and you can see here the foundations of the fort. And you can also see that the island is covered with vegetation. It's a constant fight. And uh, at the end of the season, the gun emplacements are about the only islands where the terns can nest. We tried first fire. We knew that wouldn't work, but we tried it anyway. And we flooded the areas with seawater. And that wasn't too effective either. Finally, someone offered us a blue bulldozer with a man to run it for a day, and that looked wonderful. But then at the end of the season, the grass, the things had all grown up, and we needed to start again. I talked to someone in the mammalogy department at the museum, Carl Koopman, and he said, why not reintroduce Microtus pennsylvanica, the meadow vole? And we decided that that seemed like a good idea, so Bob Dickerman caught a few when he and Carl brought them out and released them. And within a year, uh, they had girdled all the bayberry all over the island, and the grass uh, looked as if it had been cropped by sheep, and um, everything looked absolutely wonderful. <clears throat> well, the vegetation that these little things took out was replaced then by th vegetation they didn't like. So then they didn't eat much. So we then had a problem again. And Matthew Mayle stepped in, and he turned the ground over and raked it every season until oh, three years ago. Anyway, that's helped keep it, keep it open for common terns. Common terns went from 3,000 pairs to 10,000 pairs in uh, about five years as a result of the clearing. <clears throat> the roseates didn't do much. But, oh, this, I wanted to show you our field chic. We, are, uh, we really are very aware of our presentations. Um, the, old, uh, the common people all wear hats because the commons hit very hard. They'll make a hole in your hat, and then they'll make a hole in your head. They use the same hole. So when, <laughs> that's the old kind of hat on the right over there. Um, that, Duct tape holds up a little sprig of bayberry, and it takes so much duct tape for the students to hold up the stick that the duct tape just vanishes. And so that's not a good solution. But Loretta Stillman came out, she's right here, and she uh, suggested artificial flowers. And she sewed them on the hats, and they really work well. <clears throat> the Argentinians don't like to wear them, but they'll wear cattails. Okay, this is Grace Cormans, the leader of the roseate group. The duct tape on her shorts is for marking nests that uh, can be trapped in the rocks because the roseates really use the rocks around the edge of the island uh, <clears throat> for nesting. A good roseate check, you only, <laughs> you only see the bottoms of their feet. That's the best roseate check in the world. Um, <laughs> so anyway, the roseates, while we've been there, haven't increased very much. They fluctuated between about uh, 3,000 and, and uh, mm, 7,000, maybe, not even that, 2,000. Um, but, and we tried um, building shelters, terracing the, the gun emplacements in the early 80s. And roseates did move into those places, but not very many, not very fast, and it was very expensive. So I thought we won't go on with that. However, 
after Sandy, roseates were flying up and down the island <clears throat> throughout the season calling. And it seemed to me that meant that they wanted um, places to nest because we knew that many of the places they had nested in the rocks had been washed out. And so we tried terracing again. And this time we've built a, quite a few of them. They're using them and we're hoping that this will continue and the roseate population will increase. Matthew Mail in the tower put together about 15 towers so that we could put them near the places where the roseates, the terraces were, and watch them, and they have been distributed. <clears throat> the other problem that we've had recently has been our dock. Um, here, <laughs> this is the dock. This is a dock in 2007. Um, not a very good dock. 2010, we had a wonderful dock. Sandy came along and decided it was a fun dock to take apart. This last September, the third dock was completed, and we hope, we don't have a picture of it, but we hope that it will withstand a lot of weather. <clears throat> The Sandy um, overwashed a lot of the island. The western end paths, which were creosote, were washed over and destroyed. A lot of the, um, a lot of the material was just thrown up on the shore. And <clears throat> the, many of the paths really were wonderful for oyster catchers, but any, no one else could walk on them. So we're, we're um, coping with that now. And uh, I think, well, I think we'll do something about it this spring, but I'm not sure what exactly. Um, in the beginning of the project, we did uh, both, we marked both roseate and commons together uh, on the same check, the same group, and we covered the rocks and the center part of the island where the roseates nested. <clears throat> the, we marked the nests with tongue depressors, and there are quite a few to mark. One of the things that we found on check, the number of things that were interesting, we found the, <clears throat> in the early 70s, this was a four-legged chick of the student who found it had come up to me during check. We were taking pictures of roseate down color that day. <clears throat> and she came up with a common and she wanted us to take a picture. And I said, no, Jackie, we are only doing roseates today, uh, but we'll do commons on another day. You don't like commons. I said, no, that's not true, but <laughs> we're not doing them today. So she went back to the tide line, which was her line for that day, muttering. And a little later, Jackie had a tone of voice that I could tell she knew she had something on me. And I heard the voice from the tide line, Helen. I said, yes, Jackie, I have a common here. You'll want to take a picture. It has four legs, and I don't know which one to band. <laughs> so <laughs> it did have four legs, and she checked that little turn for three days, and then it died. But we had other, we had this one and others tested by Robert Riseborough, and the levels of PCBs were higher than either DDT or mercury. And this is the kind of abnormality you see in birds that have been affected by PCBs. And that was, a, that was an interesting thing in itself, but we also had the bait fish tested and they were also high in PCBs. And so the sport fish that are eating the bait fish were accumulating the PCBs and that could affect us as well as the terns. So um, a lot of things that PCBs were used in or banned at that time, and this provided part of the evidence for doing that. <clears throat> Here, this is, these are the first terraces. You see the, the white things mark where they've been used by roseates, but it's not, they don't by any means use all the places they could. So, um, but we found a nest on the terraces that was kind of interesting. Uh, a male and two females were incubating the eggs. And since they, they're used to incubating for an hour or an hour and a half, but with this nest, there were so many birds, and they all wanted to incubate, so they'd push each other off the nest. 
And you see up in the top here, there, that one is pushing this one off. And then it didn't get it off, so it, then it walks back over, and then it walks back here over, then, and then again. And finally, this one got off. But that was an interesting watch. And we placed bets on how many chicks would, would uh, um, <clears throat> survive, and three did. And that was not because a male and two females were feeding, which is what I thought would happen. The females are very lackadaisical. They might bring in a fish or they might not. The male brought in 72% of the fish for these three. And uh, he, he was very good. At the very beginning, he would feed them so much that they would just sit in the bushes and they wouldn't come out when he brought in a fish and he had to go find them. But um, anyway, that, uh, when the third one hatched, uh, he, he came into the nest. I happened to be on the watch that day. He came in with a fish and he called and a little head stuck, it, stuck out from the side of the adult and he made a 90 degree turn and fed that, that chick because the other two were so stuffed they were in the bushes and not coming out at all. <clears throat> Most eggs hatch normally. Uh, here is a picture of a common egg hatching and you see that little calcareous white knob at the end of the bill, which helps the chick break through the shell. <clears throat> the common chicks and roseate chicks look quite different. However, uh, they do, the parents have hybridized, and roseate chicks, within 24 hours of hatching, have black legs, and the common chicks stay white or pink and the hybrids have brown legs. I'll show you those in a second. This top, um, top chick is almost an albino. It has pink eyes, but it also has some brown in the scapulars, but it's the closest thing to an albino we've ever found. <clears throat> At the top, you see the roseate chick leg black on top, the common underneath, and the hybrids in the lower right um, with brown legs, sort of a compromise. Um, oh, wait. The first thing that, when the chick hatches, it calls for fish, and the parents begin to bring fish to the young. And the young will tackle anything. You can see this one. His eyes are kind of glazed, and he's up on his hind legs, and he's the chick, the, the, the fish isn't down, and it's probably going to be down to about here by the time he is able to really eat it. But what he'll do is he'll lie down now and then digest slowly, and slowly the, chick, the fish disappears. This parent is a very good one. You see the chick has the fish hanging out of his mouth. The parent is scolding him and telling him to swallow it because other parents might come in and rob him. Sometimes the chick is just lifted off the ground when another adult comes in and, and takes the fish. This happens when there's scarcity of fish. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Here is a common who's brought in several fish at once. And no, I'm sorry, it's a roseate. Um, but anyway, I think there are five fish in its bill, um, sort of like the puffins. And they do that often when there are a lot of fish, a lot of bait fish in the area around the island. We, to trap the adults, we use these hardware cloth traps, which we make. And um, this, whoever set this trap is going to be very pleased to have two at once so they don't have to reset. This is once the person who set the trap comes back to pick up the bird, they take it out of the trap and put it in a bag, cloth bag, which has a number or a, a name and record it, and then they bring it in for processing. Here's a very good catch. She's very pleased. This was her first year, and she did very well. The people take the adults that come in they're put in batches, like the supermarket, and then they're brought in and processed in the banding room. And Joe is in charge of this part of the program, and they call their bag number, and he calls the nest number to them. 
<clears throat> Some people like this part the best. This is releasing the bird. <clears throat> Here's Joe. After each trapping session, we play bingo, and that is to check what's been written in the banding room against what was written in the field so that we're sure to have the right nest numbers for the right birds. And here, everyone looks a little tired. These, at, during peak, when everything hatches at the end of June, uh, the sessions go on for quite a long time. People go to bed about 10, and that's late. <clears throat> a few, well, in 1993, the Roseate Recovery Team met. They met once a year, and uh, the, the head of the recovery team looked out over our heads, and he said, are any of you, would any of you be interested in finding out where Roseate's winter? Because we don't know. And one of, a friend of mine said, needle in a haystack, I don't have time. So I looked at Grace, who was in charge of Roseate's on Gull, and I said, shall we go? She said, yes. So, <laughs> so we, had, we raised our hands and we said, we're interested in going, but there was no notice taken of that. And, um, but they didn't say no. So in 95, we did go down. <clears throat> And we depended on boat transportation and car transportation to, <laughs> <clears throat> some of it was better than others. <laughs> um, but uh, we started in Argentina because I was afraid that the Roseate and Commons looked so much alike that they could easy, Roseates could easily be missed in a group. And so we reached Punta Rasa, which was, Joe had a book on bird, uh, bird places in South America, and the book said common turn singular at Punta Rasa. So we went to Punta Rasa. And there, at dusk, 20 to 30,000 common terns were in the air. It was the biggest concentration, of roosting concentration, that we ever found along the coast of South America. <clears throat> Esteban Bremer was the man who organized the trapping, the netting there, and here he's, uh, he's, I think he's at Punta Rasa here. Later, bits of Punta Rasa sort of got blown away, and so they would go out in kayaks to the point, set the nets, and then come back, and then go out again, and then bring the birds in for processing. <clears throat> Most of the work that we did along the coast by boat was done with this piloto. And the man who rented it to us one day, I think we used it for about four or five years, and one day he came down with this big smile on his face and a huge fish, which he gave to the man who cooked. And we had fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner <laughs> for six days. And I don't remember what kind it was, but it, the man who cooked did a lot with it, and that was all right, but it did, by the end of the week, we were ready for something else. <laughs> um, we looked and looked and looked along the coast of South America between Argentina and um, <clears throat> the uh, um, North Point. We didn't do anything on the North Coast. And we hadn't found anything, and then we decided to go to the Abroyos Islands off the coast and see if by any chance there were roseates out there. And on the way out, we heard a very familiar call and saw familiar looking birds. And I asked the captain to stop, and the birds landed on the water very close to the boat. So there was room for, um, room for taking pictures, and we'd found the needle in the haystack. And so we felt very good. <laughs> um, as we went along the coast, we often saw shrimp boats with passengers. And the terns would ride in the rigging until they stopped to take the shrimp nets out. And then they'd throw the bycatch back into the water. And the terns would feed then on the bycatch. Now, there were several places between Salvador and a little south. In fact, we found five places where uh, roseates and commons um, gathered at night. That was another thing. 
Uh, they weren't there during the day. In Argentina, some were there during the day, but that was a huge concentration. These were smaller concentrations, and there was nothing there during the day. <clears throat> so Tom, Grace's son, decided to, this is typical sandbars along the coast there near Salvador. They're beautiful and they change, which is probably good for the birds. No, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. I, okay, there. Um, we were netting in um, Brazil with Pedro Lima, and he liked to put up long lines of nets. This is Pedro in front, that's Tom Corman's in back. And Tom put these radios on the birds and then held an antenna up and tried to spot where they were. And we found <clears throat> concentrations here, pretty large concentrations, and we wondered if they were always the same birds in these concentrations. So Tom and his mother and Pedro and his son um, checked these concentrations over a period of three days, and they found that they were not always the same birds, and, the same, and birds moved from one concentration to another for roosting, which is not, I mean, that's what you might expect, but we, hadn't, we didn't know that until they did this, which is, Tom also flew with another man in Brazil, and he came in one day and he said, Helen, when we fly off the coast, he would follow them out in the morning because they left before first light, and we didn't know where they go, where they did go, or how far out they went. Um, and I said, well, if you give me the locations, we'll go in a fast boat to that spot, and you come out in the plane. So we did that, and it was a very hot, still day, and uh, we found them in the, along the line you see there. And we got, almost, we got almost to the place, the location, where we were supposed to go. And the man asked me, he, we hadn't seen a thing. And he said, do you want to go on? Meaning he didn't. And I said, yes, we do. We want to go to the center of the coordinates. And when we got to the center, we saw this. And they were feeding on sport fish. And the people in our party that Cape Pedro had brought with us to identify what they were feeding on were there, and they could identify it, which was wonderful. And so the, then the, when the feeding stopped, they'd sit on the water this way. And this same pattern was described by Beck who collected for the museum in the late 19th century. And I thought that was interesting, off Salvador. He was off Salvador. This is pretty close to Salvador. <clears throat> in looking at the bands that we got with Pedro, we saw that there was a transatlantic movement in both commons and roseates. This is a diagram of roseates, but you see a roseate or several from the Azores and Europe come and winter with commons from or roseates from <clears throat> the Northeast colonies. That was kind of interesting. That was something, this is a common pattern. It's very similar. Um, but that transatlantic movement hadn't been described at all. So we were very pleased to have that. <clears throat> so then I, I thought, well, we've looked along the east coast of South America. Um, where else could we look for birds that are roosting? I asked Pedro, and he suggested we go to Quixaba. And so we did. And there was a sort of beach place that sold soft drinks and beer and other things. And we asked the fishermen to come in and to bring their bands. And we said that we didn't want to take the bands. We would give them back to them. But we just wanted to read the numbers. And so the fishermen came in, and they threw the bands on the table, and every one of them was closed. And that meant to me, as I looked at them, that they're either pulling them off over the foot or cutting the leg off to get the band. And I thought, that's terrible. So I said, we have to do something about this. And there was a man from an NGO nearby who said, we will help you. And I'll never forget it because <clears throat> it was the kind of thing that they were equipped to do, and they did send a man to the 
uh, talk with the fishermen in Kashaba, tell them why the birds were banded, where they were banded, why the band should stay on. And so um, he discovered that what the people in Kashaba wanted more than anything else was to have a regatta in which they raced the boats that they made for their children to teach the children how to fish. And they'd never had a race, and so the race was arranged, and it was a great success, and they wanted to do it another year. So, I'm sorry, that's really not, hmm. okay. Here are the boats they made for their children, and um, this, this particular uh, race, that was a success. They wanted to do it again. So they added a beach cleanup this time to the event. And then the ladies in the village asked if they could race with laundry on their heads for this event. And they also asked if they could call it the Turn Festival. And I thought that was wonderful because it meant that they really understood what all this celebration was about. And so they did, they had the race. And um, th subsequently they've had uh, other days in which the turn festival is celebrated. The children dress up like turns in the bottom here. They, I think two years ago they asked a doctor to come for the whole day because that village didn't have a doctor. And uh, so anyone could go to him on that day if they wanted to. I thought that was a very nice idea. Thank you. I think that's all. These are the credits. These are all the people involved in this presentation. Um, a lot, and I haven't all the names of the people who do the check on the island or do the check in South America, but there are a lot of those too. So we're very lucky to be able to do this project, and I wanted to take this time to mention that um, we need people to work on the island this summer, and that would be Matthew Mail is going to be out the last two weeks in April, and also the first two weeks in September. And he needs people to help him build some of the buildings. Um, also, there are other things like removing grass, running a tractor. Um, I don't know whether any of you would be interested in doing that, but we'd love to have you come if you are. And I have a little pad, and I can take your name down and send you a little more information about it if you're interested. Um, I would also like to say that we need people to help this summer, which would be uh, beginning in May. We have work, what we call work weekends then, and we'll be marking nests from probably the second weekend in May through uh, the end of May. And that's a very easy thing um, to do, and you walk all over the island and you mark the nests. And, uh, if you, and if you like doing what you're doing, you can always come back. So, <laughs> so anyway, I, I don't think I have anything else now. Or, yeah. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions, if there are any. Hi, thank you, that was wonderful. Um, I have a question about the populations that are moving from the United States down to Brazil and areas in the south, and then up into, I guess it looked like England. Do you know if they are interchangeable? Do you know if birds only go to the US, or if they only go to England, or if they kind of- That's a good question. I don't know. I know that um, one bird that they trapped had been banded on the east coast of the US, and that was probably on a nest. That same bird was then picked up in the Azores on a nest in another year. And that was a kind of interesting thing because it meant that there may be gene exchange between the group groups, but we haven't banded enough to really track enough birds to determine whether they, but that suggests that they don't always go to the same place. Mm -hmm. Hi, Alan. Um, thank you. And just one quick thing and then my question. Uh, can you give us an update on the oldest known turn that uh, you know of at this time? 
the age of a, of the. Oh, we have eight, um, 20, 28 for common and 25 for roseate. All right, thank you. Uh, my question is, there are a lot of people in the audience tonight, and um, as uh, Chip had mentioned earlier, Smith Point could be a challenging habitat to manage for promotion of uh, nesting success. And I've been to Gull Island, it seems a little bit more easily. It's to manage the landscape in a way that you may want to without as many uh, political and, and legal uh, restrictions. And I have been there and I know that you mentioned the management of the nesting grounds for just the just the plants that are there. Uh, there are many people in the audience. Um, maybe can you describe what, what you've tried, what's worked, and maybe what, what you can use help with for... Oh, fair, right. Well, we need help with this vegetation problem. We've tried, um, well, we tried burning and flooding, and we'll try, and we tried poison, but the vegetation comes back. And I heard a talk last fall in which the man was talking about using, um, you know, those fire throwers. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> but I, I don't know how to do it, and I don't know anyone who does it. But I have his card, and he knows of a group that would do it. And I'd like to try that, because it looked as if it had worked on Faulkner's for a small area. Um, yes, does that answer the question, or is that not enough? Uh, Right. If any of you, you see what we don't want, I mean, there, one of the people on the committee wants to put in plants that will fight for their space. The problem is we don't want plants. We want bare ground in some places, and maybe we have to plant some plants that don't move quickly or stay more or less in the same place. Um, that's another, that may be the, what we have to do. I just don't know. But if any of you have any thoughts about it, we'd love to hear them. Um, because we have a big problem with um, wild radish, uh, Phragmites. And bittersweet, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're all things that we could get rid of but we don't want other things coming in either, so I don't, I'm not sure what's the best plan. But this thing that worked on Faulkner's looked quite good because they had a bare space left, and that seemed to stay bare. But if any of you think of something, please say something. <laughs> or get in touch with me at the museum. That would be great. And I, well, I have a question for you. Um, those of you who've walked around in turn colonies, do you, um, do you feel that the turns aim at you? <laughs> There's a, well, I don't think they do. But, I mean, but I, I'm in the minority on the island. Everyone else thinks they do. But I think they become frightened when they come over you. When they get close, they're frightened. And that's when they unload and head up. But um, nobody subscribes to that theory. <laughs> I don't know. Hi. So um, you mentioned in the beginning various different methods that were used to try and keep the vegetation down, um, like fire and uh, mechanical methods and animal methods. How did um, the vegetation stay down um, and allow Gull Island to become this nesting spot before human intervention? Yeah. Um, so you, you've talked about several um, ways that you've controlled the vegetation. The question is, how was the vegetation held down for the gulls to actually start the colonies there in the first place? Right. Um, well, there was a lot of grass. There were, was a lot of grass, short grass. And um, I think they just came right in, and, it, and the turns came in, and they started 
as long as they can start, they're fine. What they do now is, you see, the people who want to do the poisoning and they want to control, really control, um, have come out in August. At that point, we have a jungle. <clears throat> However, early in the season, when the, before the vegetation really starts growing, um, there are quite a few empty spots, and that's when the 10,000 commons begin, and they have enough places, and they shade out the place where they put their eggs so that they get to a point where they're feeding the young, the young are hiding in the vegetation, and that's fine. It's the birds that are a little bit later and at the end of the season that don't have the spots, and that we'd like them to, but I'm not sure we're going to be able to manage that. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. 17. So 17 acres. Okay, other questions? All right, so we have a, a couple of challenges for, for the audience. If you want to volunteer, um, see, see Helen. She'll be up here, um, and she'll have a pad if you want to add your name to it and, and your contact information. The others, if you, if you have ideas for her and her team to uh, control the vegetation, all you know, she's dealing with inv invasive species just like the rest of us, um, but uh, doing it for the terns. Okay. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you, Helen. Thank you.